Well, we're going to be studying in 1 Samuel chapter 8 this morning. We are surely glad to have each of you here with us this morning. And as always, I say I hope that you are blessed, encouraged, strengthened by what we study. But it's going to be a challenge. This, this lesson has been a challenge for me all week long until as late as last night and as late as early this morning, trying to figure out what is really going on in this story for all of us. So let me start like this. I think each of us in this room this morning probably has had this kind of an experience. We have gotten some idea in our mind that we think will make life easier or better for us, and we keep thinking about it, and as we all know by now, what we focus on grows, it gets larger and larger, and we begin to get more and more excited about it. But then someone comes along and someone begins to say to us, you know, what you're thinking about doing really will not work all that well. In fact, if you end up doing what you're thinking about doing, it will turn out to be very bad for you. And yet my passion is so great and my excitement is so great, I do not listen to them. Now, have you ever done that? I've done that more times than I want to admit. And I've experienced it with my children. Maybe you have too. They, they, they get this idea and they get so excited about it and they keep focusing on it. It gets larger and larger. And you try to talk to them and say, I, I don't think this is the right direction. I don't think this is the right choice. I don't think this is the right young lady or right young man. And they just won't listen. It's happening in our nation right now. I am a bit hesitant to say this, and yet I think I should say this. In my opinion, we have been blessed to live in the greatest nation that's ever occupied space on this earth. It's been a nation of more freedom. It's been a nation of more democracy. It's been a nation where ordinary people can dream big dreams and work and make those dreams come true. It's called capitalism. And yet there is a segment of our population, and it's growing, and it's very vocal, that looks across the way, across the ocean, and they say, if we could be more like them, if, if we could be more, it's called socialistic, then the government would have more power and the government would be able to take care of us with better health care and free health care and maybe for our college tuition and maybe a, a guaranteed minimum salary. And some people have really bought into that and they're thinking about it more and more and their excitement becomes greater and greater. And if you sit down and try to talk to them and explain to them what it might really truly be like, they will not listen. Last Thursday, I received a call from a longtime friend of mine. He was the, at the point of his retirement, the senior vice president for UPS over all European operations. And he said, Ken, I've got to make a trip back to Europe. Though I've been retired for some time, I've got to go back to France and I've got to give a deposition. We're in a lawsuit over there. My name is still on the contract, and so they want to depose me. And he says, it's frivolous, it's, it's not any good. And then he made this little statement that caught my attention. He said, it's what you get when you decide to do business in a socialistic country. I thought, wow. And yet we have people who want it so badly. And, and I'm not really faulting them because I've done the same thing in my own life. I... I I've let this thinking get out of control in my emotions, and then someone comes and says, this is not the right thing, and I will not listen. You've had it. I've had it. And that's exactly what's going on in this passage we're going to study today. Because as you well remember by now, Samuel is the last leader in that period that we call the period of the Judges. 
Samuel had an unusual beginning, but his life as a leader, as a judge, as a prophet, as a priest has been stellar. He's been God's man. And under his leadership, the Israelites have won battle after battle after battle, and they seem to have had prosperity, and life has been really good under the days of Samuel. But Samuel has gotten old. It happens to all of us. And to be more blunt, Samuel's time has passed. We, we all have our season. We all have our time. We all have our thing. And that passes. And now as an older man, he does what his predecessor did. He begins to turn some of his responsibilities over to his two sons. Ironically, his two sons are like the two sons of his predecessor, Eli, we talked about last week. They are corrupt. They, they accept bribes. They pervert justice. I don't know why. Maybe again, still growing up in a house of a very, very godly man, but maybe it's privilege, and maybe it's power, and maybe it's prestige, and maybe it's money. Those things are so corrupting. And now as you begin chapter 8, it's apparent that the elders of Israel have seen the corruption in the two sons of Samuel, and they've been thinking about it, and they've been wondering what to do, and, and they're getting really excited about an idea. They have a new idea. And so they go to Samuel, and they give Samuel their idea and their request. They say, Samuel, your sons are not walking as you walked. Your sons aren't good leaders. Your sons are making a mess of things. And we want for you to give us a king. So we can be like other nations. We want for you to give us a king. Well, Samuel's crushed by the idea. He's, he, he's hurt. He feels the pains of rejection. And everybody in this audience also can identify with that, can't you? For we all know what it feels like to be rejected. It's one of those areas of life where we're all the same. So if we had person after person after person to tell what it felt like when you were rejected, this, the answer would sound almost identical. He's hurt. And he goes to God. And he explains the situation to God. They're asking for a king. God makes an amazing statement to Samuel. He said, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They are rejecting me. But before I give them a king, I want you to go and I want you to explain to them exactly what life will be like with a king. Now I want you to listen to what he says about how life will be if you get a king. If I can read this without glasses, but it's hard for me to maneuver glasses up here. This is what a king will, who will reign over you will do. He'll take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. They'll run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign as commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others he'll have to plow the ground and reap the harvest. Still others will make weapons for war and equipment for chariots. He'll take your daughters. He'll make them be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He'll take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain, give it to his officials. Your men servants and maid servants and the very best of your cattle and donkeys, he'll take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. trying to explain to them what life would be like if they get what they want. It sounds horrible to me, doesn't you? Who would want a king under those circumstances? He's going to take your sons, push them into slavery. He's going to take your daughters, push them into slavery. He's going to take your best fields. He's going to, he's going to tax you. 
But when they hear all of that, it says they will not listen. They will not listen. Because they're wanting a king so badly and their emotions are so high. And when your emotions go high, your ability to reason goes low. When you're very angry or when you're thinking you're passionately in love, no matter what anybody says to you, you do not pay much attention. As your emotions go up, your intellect goes down. It's always been that way. They will not listen. And they say, give us a king. We want a king. And one thing about God is He gives us the ability to choose. And thus we have the end of the period of the judges and we have the beginning of that time in Israel when they are ruled by kings. And I've really struggled What is the lesson for us in this small passage of Scripture that is so important? What is the lesson? Well, I I could tell you to be careful what you think about, but that's not what I want to talk about. And you might say, well, there's something here about being content, and there probably is. And you might get the idea that change is wrong, but that's, that's, that's not the right conclusion. I'm, I'm telling you, life is filled with change. You can't exist in this life without change. And sometimes you do need to change the job that you're doing. And sometimes you do need to change the city where you live. Susan and I have done that multiple times. And sometimes life is passing to the point that now my Ability to perform has changed, and maybe it's time for me to retire. Life is full of change. But I don't know what the application is and all that. You can decide for yourself. But there's one phrase, there's one phrase in that story that captured my attention. And I'm not sure what to do with it. God said to Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they are rejecting me. Now that poses an interesting question for me. I've always thought about rejecting God as being something where I just turn my back on Him and say, I'm done with this, I'm going a different direction. But that's not what they did. They weren't turning their back on God. They, they still wanted to have God over them and help them win battles and so forth. And they weren't turning their back on that old law of Moses. And they weren't turning their back on the traditions. They were still doing those things. And they intended to still do those things. And yet God looks at them and says, You're rejecting me. And I found myself wondering, Is it possible for me to reject God and and still kind of continue with everything that we all do? I come on Sunday mornings, I I have some Bible reading, and I do whatever, and still reject God. And finally, finally, maybe I have what's really going on. Their rejection was in this form. Their rejection was in God's providential care and trust in God. I want you to listen to something. I want you to listen to something that's that's going on. When they tell Samuel no, when they refuse to listen, they said this, We want a king over us. Then we'll be like like other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. They've had prosperity. They've had victory after victory. Who's been fighting their battles up to now? God has. God has fought every single battle and given them victories during the days when Samuel was the leader. But now they're saying, 
We'd rather have a king, and that king can go out and fight our battles. And God is saying, you're rejecting me. I can fight a battle better than anybody can fight a battle. And you want a king? In spite of all this that's going on? They're going to take your sons, your daughters, your, your crops, your, and you want a king because you think he'll fight the battles for you better than I will fight them? Here's the lesson. God wants us, as born-again children of His, to put our trust in Him. To know that He will fight our battles. It's when I go out here in this world somewhere and try to find something to make up something in my life that will be better instead of having God to lean on. And I lean on a king, or whatever it might be. That's when God looks at me and says, are you rejecting me? You think he can take better care of you than I can take of you? You see, when we bought into this life as Christians, we bought into the lordship of Jesus Christ. We bought into being children of the absolute almighty God that hung the stars in the sky. We bought into being children of the God with whom all things are possible. And He wants us to live like that. And these people, they're thinking, yeah, God gave us these battles, but the king can go out and fight for us. It's another lesson that brings us back to this core thought. That we need to be a people dependent in every area of our life on God first. I may depend on a doctor. I may depend on a friend. I may depend on my spouse. I may depend on other people all the way through life. But I'm telling you, God wants me to depend upon Him first. And these people, they think a lot of kings going to fight their battles for them instead of God. It won't go so well. It won't go so well. So I call you this morning to be a people as children of God. To put God first in every single thing. And trust Him in all areas of life.